Hey, we are uh, wrapping up this series called Lies I Still Believe. Um, and I thought I'd start off by showing you guys just a picture of my family. Uh, so uh, this is it. Uh, this is my family right here. Uh, that's my wife, Hope. Um, and uh, this picture I like because it illustrates to me how God does not work according to my plan. Because they were, a few weeks ago, we were at this wedding. They were coming down, and the sun was just coming, like, just the most brilliant, like, light ever. And I was like, stop right there. I want to take a picture. I grabbed my phone. And this is my wife trying to reason with a two-year-old. <laughs> it was not successful. But uh, not only is it the picture not the way that I was planning, uh, but also when I think to, to life, uh, you know, I always wanted a girl. And God gave me not a girl one and not a girl two, uh, our two boys there. And then if I'm honest with you, um, uh, my plan, uh, if it was my plan that God was following, hope would not be the person I'm married to. Some of y'all laughing at that, okay. Here's why, because I, for the longest time, my, my thought was I would marry someone from my own race, from my own background, my own culture. But this picture is valuable to me because it reminds me that the lie that we so often believe is that my plan is good. And the only way to combat that is with this truth. God's plan is best. Amen? And when I look at that picture, I think, man, God's plan is so good. It's best. It's better than the way I planned it. So I thought there's a person in Scripture that illustrates this really well. His name is Jacob. So if you want to jump there right now, Genesis chapter 32. Uh, Genesis 32, as we get into it, I want to give you a little bit of context to who Jacob was. Uh, if you know Jacob, you know Jacob was known as a deceiver. Um, and, and his story begins, he's actually a twin. And so when he is coming out of the womb, actually his older brother is the first one to come out. Uh, and he comes out of the womb, his older brother comes out, and he's red and hairy. Think Elmo, right? And so his family sees it, and they're like, oh, he's red, so we'll name him Esau, which means red. And then Jacob comes immediately after that, holding on to the heel of his brother. And they say, oh, look, he's a heel grabber, so we'll name him heel grabber, Jacob. There's, Old Testament people were not great at naming things. But that, that, that title, heel grabber, has this kind of underhanded tone to it. And so it's the idea that Jacob was a deceiver, a trickster, a schemer. And you have to know this. I've been in the room when a baby is born. When babies are born, they have no idea what they're doing. I have no idea what they're doing. But this label is placed on Jacob's life from the moment of his birth. And guess what? It sticks. That sticks with all of Jacob's life because that's what Jacob grows up to become, a deceiver. And you see him scheming and deceiving his brother, and then he schemes and deceives his father in order to get the blessing of being the elder son. And you might say, hey, what's the big deal about that blessing? Well, according to their custom, the, the older brother had this blessing, this, this tradition of everything would go to the older brother, right? All the wealth, all the livestock, all the, all the things would be the older brothers. And the younger brother would be a servant to the older one. So that was a big deal. But on top of that, Jacob was a descendant of Abraham who had a very special covenant with God. A special blessing was on Abraham. And that was passed down from Abraham to Isaac and now to one of Isaac's sons, either Esau or Jacob. And so Jacob knew this was a big deal. He deceives his father in order to get that. His brother finds out that the blessing was stolen from him and he swears to kill Jacob. Jacob hears the threat. He runs away. He runs away and he goes all the way to his uncle's house. His uncle's name is Laban. He meets one of his cousins and he marries a cousin. Then he marries another cousin. Now, rule of thumb, if you're going to marry a cousin, you should stop at one. Okay? But Jacob marries two of his cousins. His uncle, now turned father-in-law, turns out to be a deceiver himself. So the tables are kind of turned on Jacob. And Jacob, for the next 20 years of his life, is being deceived and taken advantage of by 
by his uncle. He realizes, I have to get out of this relationship. And so he flees his father-in-law's house. In the middle of the night, he takes his family, his wealth, everything he has. He runs away. There's bad blood. He can't go back there. And on his way back, he, or on his way out, he realizes the only place he can go is back home. And on his way back home, he hears a messenger tell him that his brother, the one he tricked, the one he deceived, the one he schemed against, is coming towards him with an army of, get this, 400 men. And so here is Jacob between a rock and a hard place. The planner, the schemer, the deceiver, he's planned it so well that he's put himself in the most difficult situation possible. Have you ever been there? Like you planned something and, and you schemed and you got it all together and it turns out it puts you in the worst situation possible. Like it puts you in a, in a terrible relationship. It puts you in the middle of a heartbreak. It puts you in the middle uh, of the situation you don't want. That's where Jacob's at. So that's where we pick up our text, Genesis 32. It says this, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. Now, I don't know who of you grew up with wrestling in your life, but I grew up with some WWF. You remember that? In fact, I'm going to teach you a word in my native tongue, Malayalam. Everybody say goo. Sti. Now put it together. Goo sti. Y'all just spoke Malayalam. Congratulations. Uh, but what that word means is fighting or wrestling. And whenever my dad would scream, Samson, Gusti, it meant whatever we're doing in the house, we had to run to the living room because we're about to watch WWF Thursday Night Smackdown. You know what I'm saying? So we'll all gather up to, we're going crazy. And here's the thing, my mom would judge us so much. She would look down on us. But here's the thing. Once the match got started, you look over at my mom, she's in the corner, and she's watching, and she's like, yes, hit him, hit him with the chair, hit him with the chair. <laughs> she's the sweetest lady, but she changed. Here's the thing about WWF wrestling. All right, it is a little rigged. <laughs> Just a little. But can I tell you, this wrestling match is even more rigged than WWF. Because this wrestling match, this man that comes in is no ordinary man. In fact, we find out later in scripture that this is actually God that Jacob is wrestling. In fact, the Old Testament writers had no context, no idea about Jesus. And so they had no idea of how to express God in flesh wrestling a human being. But we know now and scholars actually call this a Christophany, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus in the Old Testament. So this is possibly Jesus coming and wrestling Jacob. Verse 25, when the man saw he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Now you have to understand that the joint in your hip is one of the strongest ones in your body. It is not an easy task to wrench it out of its socket. And so Jacob realized this is no ordinary man that he's wrestling. And actually, something interesting I found this week as I was researching this, uh, one commentary, just one, uh, has a theory that because the language here is a little bit hard to understand, that there's a possibility that this is actually a euphemism uh, for another thing. That it's a sensitive way of saying that God actually punched Jacob in the groin. Listen, if there's one person in life I don't want to get punched in the groin by, it's Jesus. <laughs> but the only reason I share that is because sometimes when God challenges us for men, men in the room, sometimes it feels like an attack on our manhood. Right? When God pushes us to be different, to do things different than what we're comfortable with, we feel like it's an attack on our manhood. And you got to understand, sometimes that's exactly what God wants you to feel. Because God's plan humbles us. God's plan humbles us. And that's what's happened to Jacob. In that moment, as his hip is being wrenched out of his sight, he is being humbled in that moment. He has to face the reality that this is a big God. And he's not as big as he thinks he is. I've heard somebody say God's plan A is humility. God's plan B is humiliation. Choose humility. 
A.W. Tozer says, God can't truly bless a man until he conquers him. And that's what's happening to Jacob. He is being conquered in this moment. Verse 26, the man said, let me go for dawn is breaking. Why is he saying that? We actually don't know. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Sometimes when I come home, my, my two-year-old comes and he wraps himself around my leg and I'll have to do one of these things where I have to like pick up, you know, have you ever done that? If I wanted to, I could just shake him off, but I'm, I'm a loving dad. I don't want to hurt my kid. If God wanted to, he could have shake, she could shake Jacob off. You got to shake. Jacob is holding on. He's got half of his body is limp. He's holding on for dear life. And he's like, I won't let you go. But God cares about Jacob, no matter how reckless Jacob is being. Verse 27, what is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob, deceiver, heel grabber, trickster, schemer. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you fought with God and with men and have won. Now pause for a second. Did Jacob just really do it? Did Jacob just beat God? Think about that for a second. But I think, I think really, if you have to answer that question, you have to go back in time a little bit to really understand what's going on. See, when Jacob's mother, Rebecca, was pregnant, now, they didn't have technology, they didn't have sonograms and stuff like that back then. She had no idea what was going on. She just knew she was pregnant. And so she goes to God and she asks God what's happening. And God reveals to her that she's not having one baby, that she's actually having two. And the Lord God told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. Of course, Esau will be the strong one. But that's not what it says. It says your older son will serve your younger son. See, God's plan from the very beginning was that the first would be the last, that the greatest will be the least, that the older will serve the younger. Before Jacob ever came out holding on to the heel of his brother, God had already determined that Jacob would be the recipient of the blessing. That name that, that God gives Jacob, Israel, it comes from two words, El meaning God, Sarah meaning to contend. And it can be translated one or two ways. It can be translated either as he contends with God, as in Jacob contends with God, or God contends. And I say, okay, which one of those is true? And I would say both. See, the whole time Jacob was grabbing at heels, deceiving his brother, deceiving his father, trying to get away from his father-in-law, trying whatever to do to argue and wrestle and fight with God. The whole time he was wrestling with God, God was fighting for Jacob. Yes. Yes. Isn't that true of our life? That so often when we are fighting with God that he's actually fighting for us. We're asking, God, God, why can't you give me this marriage that I want? God, why can't you give me, bless my kids and help them succeed? God, why can't you do this? And the reality is God wants those things for us. And the whole time we're fighting against him, he is fighting for us. And that's what you see. Because God's plan contends for us. God's plan contends for us. Verse 30. So Jacob Name the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. And the sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Write this down. God's plan changes us. God's plan changes us. Jacob left there different, and it's not just a limp. It's everything. In fact, if you look at Jacob's life from this point forward, everything Jacob does from this point forward is different than what he had done before. Jacob leaves there a different man. How do you know? The very first thing that Jacob does is he walks up to his brother, the same brother he had tricked, the same brother he had stolen from, the same brother that he had deceived. He walks up to him, and when he meets him, he says this, and what a relief to see your friendly smile. It is like seeing the face of God. See, once you face God, you can face anything. 
Once you face God, you can face anything. There is nothing that you, there's no challenge, no fear, nothing that you can't face once you stood with him. And Jacob reconciles with his brother in that moment. He makes right the thing he had wronged in that moment. I think so often we, we try to figure out how to get to reconciliation in our world and our culture, especially when it comes around uh, to topics of race and culture. We, we try to do that by changing everything else, but the reality is God wants to change us. And the only way God can change us is when he wrestles and contends with us. And the only outcome of that wrestling, that contending, is that we are humbled. And it's when we are humbled and we are learning that God is doing the fighting and then we see some change in us that we start seeing change in the world around us. I showed you a picture of my wife and my two beautiful boys I remember when Hope and I were just dating. In fact, we're just about two months in. We weren't very serious. We're just talking at that point. Pastor Rodney called me into his office, and uh, he asked me, hey, how, how are things between you and Hope going? And I said, things are going good. And he said, well, Samson, how, you know, how do your parents feel about Hope? You know, what do they think about her? And I said, well, they don't feel anything because they don't even know about her. And he, he said, why don't they know anything about her? And he, granted, Pastor knew the answers to these questions. You ever met somebody that just asks you questions they know the answers to? And, they, and I said, that they don't know about her uh, because in my culture, uh, we wait uh, till we know we're going to marry. I'm just two, two months in dating her. And once I know, if it's, it takes a year or whatever it takes, once I know this is the person I want to marry, then I'll talk to my parents. And on top of that, uh, ever since I was a little kid, my parents expected me to marry an Indian girl. And if I bring someone home differently than that, they will kill me. (laughs) And so I gotta figure this out. And Pastor Rodney looks at me like I just about said the stupidest thing you possibly could say. And he says, seems if one of my kids brought home someone after a year of dating them, and they said, hey, this is the person I'm gonna marry. He said, I may go along with it, but it would hurt our relationship. At the minimum, it would hurt me. And then he said, I think it's time, and I'll never forget this. He said it so spiritually. He said, I think it's time you put on your big boy pants and you go talk to your parents about hope. And I looked at him and said, Pastor, I'll pray about that. (laughs) And I realized I had to deal honestly with this. It felt like a punch in the groin, honestly. But I realized I have to deal with this honestly. It was a humbling moment as I walked out of his office And I realized I had to do this the right way. So I called my parents. I I sat down with him. And I said, hey, I just want you to know I met somebody. And they were really excited. So they were eager. And they sat down with me. And so they said, okay, tell us about her. And I said, well, uh, and I tried to draw this out as much as I could. I said, she's a nurse. Uh, She loves Jesus. She uh, was a missionary at one point. And my dad just looks at me and said, she's not Indian, is she? (laughs) And I said, no. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, does this mean, what does this mean? Does this mean that I'm no longer part of the family or that you think this is a sin in some way or, you know, I'm kicked out? Like, and the reality is I had seen all those things happen. I had seen friends in my culture who had dated or married outside of their race, being removed from their family. And that's just something I just grew up with and just thought, never thought much about, didn't see as a big deal. And can I tell you, there's some things we grow up in our culture. 
We grow up maybe as our family tradition and we think that's just right because that's just the way things are done. Or we may not think much about it, but that doesn't make those things right. Sometimes those things are just wrong. They're sin. And so I looked at them and I just said, hey, would we still be family? Because I love my parents. And they looked at me and they said, Samson, you know, ever since you were a kid, we've always had this expectation that you grow up and bring home a nice Indian girl and that we would share the same language and we enjoy the same food. and We would be able to relate in a deep kind of way. And this brings a challenge to that. We don't know how this can happen. Sometimes you have to give people room to wrestle and talk out loud the nuances of life. But then they said, Samson, we love you. And we know you're a man of God. And if this is a decision you're making, we want to honor it. And we're behind you. And I asked them, well, do you want to meet hope? And they said, honestly, we're not ready for that right now. It took them time. Some eight months later, they got to meet Hope for the first time. And from the point that they met her, they saw in her nothing other than a daughter. They welcomed her in. They showed her grace. And now I wanna show you a picture of my family now. So there's my dad, who I tell a lot of crazy stories about, (laughs) my mom and my sister and brother-in-law and their kids, and there's me, and there's my beautiful wife, Hope, um, just after Louis was born. There's our family in all the different shades that we are. Can I tell you, there really can't be reconciliation in our world until we reconcile with God. Until we wrestle with God until we go to the mat and we are humbled by God, until we realize that he he contends with us, that he fights for us, and until we are willing to be transformed and changed by him. I wanna invite our prayer team up. You can stand up right now with me. Maybe you're here and you've never thought about this before but I just wanna enlighten you. There's another time in scripture when God took on flesh and contended for men. And it looked like he lost the battle. And that was on the cross. And on that cross, he, though he had all the power in the world, he could have called down a legion of angels to defend him, but he chose not to. He chose to die on that cross for your sin and my sin to make us right, to reconcile us to the family of God. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus, let me tell you, that's the greatest prayer you can pray. In fact, there's a number on the screen right below me. Uh, If you're watching online, you could text that number. Someone would be glad to pray with you. There's these wonderful folks here and kind of throughout the room that are willing to pray with you. But I want to encourage you to do that. But I also want to say this. For those of us who call ourselves the church, I know it's hard looking out into the world and seeing the tension, especially tension around the topic of race. It's hard to contend with that. But can I challenge you to fight the good fight? That God is doing something in us. That God is doing something in our church that I believe is gonna affect the world around us. So let's pray, God, build us up. Help us be the change. Yes. I want to pray over you. Can I do that? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the power of your gospel. That it has the power to change us. Lord Jesus, that the change you want to do in us is reflective of the change you are going to do in this world through us. And I just pray that you would help us to have a strong foundation. I pray that we would be the church that is on fire for you in our world. 
And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would see the world change as you begin to change us. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And the church said, amen.